Oh my gosh, you know, it was so thrilling to be sitting in the car and hearing that song come on the radio and say, I'm connected to that. Maybe it's not about me, but I'm connected to that. That was great. That was wonderful. I remember wanting to be an actress since I was a very little girl growing up in the Bronx. And I had this vision that someday I was going to be on The Tonight Show. Don't ask me why, but that, that was the vision I had. And I always wanted to be an actress, but there was no one in my family that was in the industry that even knew anyone in California, let alone ever been to California. So I kind of put it in the back of my mind, and I pursued you know, going to Boston College. And one day, I told my parents that I was going shopping for clothes to go away to school after I had been accepted to BC. And instead, I went into Manhattan from upstate New York at that point. I was born and raised in the Bronx, but we had moved upstate. And I went and saw an agent. And I came home that night, and I said, um, I have an agent, and I'm not going to BC. And they were great. They were very, very supportive. And it was something that was always in my heart and I always wanted to do. And so I did it. I started out modeling in New York and studying um, at night. And uh, eventually ended up here in this studio talking about the greatest American hero, which was 23 years ago. <laughs> I do remember auditioning for this show. And I remember loving the concept, loving the script, thinking it was so much fun. And I wasn't a big science fiction buff, but my character got to be real. I was the reactor. I had to react to everything. And it just had a wonderful feel about it from the very, very beginning. The audition scene was dealing with the information about seeing Ralph in the suit as he was explaining why he had the suit. And it was a wonderful audition piece. And that was the flavor of the whole show. And I just had the best time. A very, uh, not difficult, could have been difficult thing happened to me because we shot the pilot, got word that it had been picked up for a series, and then I found out I was pregnant. And it was my first child. I was, of course, very excited about this pregnancy, but I had to tell Stephen that I was pregnant, and I didn't know what that meant to him. I didn't know if it was going to interfere with his plans for the show, if he wanted to tackle how difficult it would be to hide it, and I knew I had to tell him, and I knew I needed to tell him with enough time. So I called him at his office, and I said, Mr. Cannell, I really need to see you, and he said, basically, not now, but in a nice way. <laughs> And I said, no, I really, I really do. He says, well, I'm really busy. Um, but of course, if you're saying you have something important to talk about, I'll, I'll see you. So I said, yes, it's very important. And I was expecting um, the worst, and I knew I had to do it. And so I went to him, and I said, I understand that you might have to recast this role, um, and I'm sorry. This is, you know, God's plan, and I am very happy about it. And he said, get out of here. I told you I am busy. He said, this show sold on this cast, and you're a part of it, and we will work around it. Now I'm busy. Get out. <laughs> and he was wonderful. He was just wonderful. And I did the first season of the show, Pregnant. And by the end of my pregnancy, I was very, very large. I had gained about 55 pounds. And I uh, wasn't appearing much. And we went from my carrying the suit you know, so it was covering my belly any time I entered or exited a scene to carrying anything, and then finally telephone calls, <laughs> you know, from here up. And I remember that day I was on the set, and I felt something. So when I signed out for the day, I asked the assistant director, I said, okay, I think I'm going into labor. Who do you want me to call tonight? He said, call me. And by 11 o'clock that night, I called him, and my son was born the next day. Pam Davidson was a ambitious professional woman. She was an attorney, and that seemed to be a role I was cast in often, professional, strong, successful women. And Pam was going along in this relationship and in her career, planning everything to be perfect, and all of a sudden she's hit with 
something that not very many women have to deal with. The man she loves is flipping out. He shows up in this suit and she has to actually meet him at the hospital because he's been taken to the hospital in a white jacket and she has to deal with this but still you know realize that this is the man that she loves and wants to have a future with so she has to try to absorb all of it come on both of you out of the car i'm struggling to get you a postponement on the custody case and all you can think of are some earth shoes you lost when you went flying and you you, Mr. Maxworth. Maxwell, and you're gorgeous when you're mad, sweetheart. I have had it. Uh, Pam. And quite frankly, she ends up being um, uh, very flexible and fits this into her life somehow. Everything you told me about the flying saucers and the superpowers, it's all true. Yeah? What are you going to do? Aha! Uh -huh. Finally a straight question. She had to accept that this was part of her life, that Maxwell was part of her life, and the suit was part of her life, and she was going to try to keep it as normal as possible with that being a part of it. And, um, you know, I always wanted to put the suit on. I remember going to Stephen Kennell and, you know, saying, I think it's time for Pam to just put the suit on and figure out how this suit works. But um, I think it was all too close to my having the baby, and my body just wasn't ready to put on the suit. <laughs> and it was Steve's way of being nice to not ever let that happen. But he did let me fly with him. I, and that was another thing I always wanted to do, is I always wanted to fly with Ralph, fly on his back. And that was great. The instructions would not be missing if Pam was there when the green guys gave Ralph the suit. I loved that we didn't go to a studio every day when we were shooting the show. We were on location every day, and every day was different. And at the time, I really did not know my way around. I would get a map the day before and figure out how to get there, and I'd get there. And if you ask me today where we shot, I really couldn't tell you exactly where we shot, but it was always someplace on location. We had a studio with the Hinkley home, so we had our basic sets um, of the Hinkley home and offices in a warehouse somewhere. But I loved being someplace different every day. We did a lot of driving. We did a lot of night shooting which meant we were driving at night with a camera on the car and sometimes a camera in the truck in front of us. And when I wasn't driving, I would be sitting in the middle of the shot. It was usually Robert Culp Maxwell driving and Ralph, Billy Cat, sitting in the front seat and I would be in the back seat and have to sneak between the two of them. And I think if you look at William Cat's left shoulder, my nail marks are in his shoulder because I would always be so scared. We had to drive really fast and Robert was driving that car very, very fast late at night and I would dig my nails into <laughs> Billy's shoulder and he probably still has scars. The ideas were limitless. There was no limit to the amount of stories that could come from this concept because Stephen just kept creating these powers. And one of my favorite was when he was magnetized and his body became a magnet, and he couldn't go in a room that had any metal. We were shooting a scene in a motel room, and we ordered room service. I remember thinking, you know, there's no limit to the amount of situations, the amount of powers that this suit can have. The holograms, the flying, seeing into the future. There was no end to what he could do. And it was always interesting, it was always fun to read the scripts and see, you know, what Stephen had created, what power he had created. I loved seeing the shows air. I did. I loved seeing them before they aired, and I loved watching them and seeing how everything is put together, especially a show with special effects. And it never, ever turns out the way I thought it would. I just find that whole thing fascinating because you're there on the set and you have one vision of it and especially working with a blue screen and you know going over and looking at playback and of course nothing is there and then seeing how after all these magicians get to do their part how wonderful it all comes together and Pam had a hard place in the threesome because she was always in the way 
Maxwell hated the skirt. Maxwell sometimes needed the counselor. So when Maxwell needed the counselor, he knew how to get what he wanted and needed. That's the question, Bill. Well, it's a lousy question. Counselor, uh, get him to back off of me. No. You want me in my super suit? You want a good third string utility backup man? That's the deal. Most of the time, he saw the skirt as an obstacle for his goals, and that is always to use the suit to do the FBI work and to fight the bad guys. Freeze your face. <laughs> ah, counselor, thanks. <laughs> Give me. Wow! Ah, uh, thanks, dear. I remember Robert writing his scripts and how excited he was, how intense he was about writing and directing an episode of The Greatest American Hero. He took it very, very seriously, and we all knew how important it was, and we all knew we had to take it seriously because Billy Cat and I really did like to goof around and joke around and, and have a good time. I mean, we did. I loved joking with Billy, but we knew that when Robert was directing his episode that we really had to give him, you know, the respect. And, not that we didn't give every director respect, I don't mean that. I just mean that um, this was extra, extra special to Robert. I think a couple of times he may have cracked his whip on us, but we, we came to. <laughs> but Billy and I did. We had a lot of fun. He would stay up nights trying to figure out how he could, you know, crack me up. And I remember once we were bored and we were in the car, but it was one of those car scenes where the car wasn't being towed. We had walkie-talkies in the car, and the director would say action on the walkie-talkie, and then we had to drive, and the camera was waiting to see us. And I remember once we were both hungry, so we just drove to McDonald's, and we got some McDonald's I came back and they said, where were you? Where? They're calling on the walkie-talkie, of course, and where are you? We were troublemakers. Michael Paré was great. He was great. But the one thing, you know, I remember about the kids, they were all fun. Faye Grant was beautiful and fun. But they looked at us as the adults. You know, and I didn't want to be looked at as the adult at the time, and I think some of the kids were actually the same age as me, but they were the kids and looked at us as the adults. And um, I wanted to be a part of their fun because they, they would always be having fun. I wanted to be a part of their fun, but we were the adults. I remember being thrilled that June Lockhart was playing my mom. And it was also wonderful when Barbara Hale came to play Ralph's mom. Barbara Hale, of course, um, Billy Cat's mom in real life came to play his mom. Oh, that was great. That was wonderful. Stephen Kennell was very involved in, in this show, and he did something that I later copied. He gave up one lunch a week to come down to the set and read through the next week's script with us so that we, he could hear it out loud and we can voice any concerns, have any questions we had answered, make any changes that needed to be made. And we would just have the best time sitting, reading through the script, and fleshing out any of the problems. He cared. He cared about what we thought, and that's what I thought was wonderful. He cared about what we thought about the scripts and was very willing to either, you know, make his point and explain it to us why it was important to keep it the way it was or make any changes we were wanting. It was great. When there's chemistry with characters that really works, that's what I think makes a show last for years and years, is, is that chemistry. The pilot is still my favorite of all of the episodes. I could still feel the excitement and the energy of, of doing that pilot. The show became very popular very quickly. I was amazed at the very large range of ages of our fans. The Greatest American Hero was watched by the very young and the very old. Everyone was a fan of The Greatest American Hero. And it still it. amazes me that people are watching it and just being introduced to it and, and still loving it. It's endless. There aren't many storylines. There aren't many ideas that you could look back on that you can say that would still work. There aren't. It's a gem. My son was born on that show, and I guess it was his second 
second Halloween, yeah, it had to be a second Halloween, I decided he was going to be the greatest American hero. So I snuck into the wardrobe trailer and I got one of the suits and I did get permission and I cut the emblem off of his suit and I sewed it onto a red turtleneck uh, top and bought red tights and the black cape and I turned this two-year-old into the greatest American hero and it was wonderful. And then of course I saved that suit. I made my daughter 13 years later at two, I made her be the greatest American hero. Not heroine, she was the greatest American hero because that suit was the greatest American hero. And then my son was um, director of a camp and he's 23 years old now. And as director of entertainment at his camp, he was having a party, a superhero party. So I cut the emblem off of that little t-shirt and I sewed it on a very big t-shirt for him and he was the greatest American hero again. It was wonderful, wonderful. So it lasts a long time. It's timeless. The greatest American hero is timeless.